Okay. So today, hopefully now you can hear me okay. Everybody can hear me? All right. Uh, today we're going to do a session on identifying carburetors. I know a lot of you got a shelf full of carburetors and you got 8, 10, 12 carburetors up there. And somebody says, hey, I need a carburetor for my 66. And you go, well, I don't know. I might have one. There's a whole bunch here. How do you tell them apart? Does it make a difference? Should you know the difference? Well, the answer is yes to all those. You should know the difference. And there, there are certain uh, changes that the Corvair carburetor evolved. So what I'm going to try and do here tonight is uh, kind of give you a little history lesson on uh, the different types of Corvair carburetors. We have quite a few of them here. They're, they're not all the same. So we want to look at these. And uh, I want you to understand the differences because as time went on, uh, certain changes were made. Some of them uh, are very helpful for the operation of your car. So on this piece here, this is a, a demonstrator actually from the GM Training Center. It's a little rusty and crusty right now, but this is what they used uh, at the GM Tech Center to show the mechanics, the new dual carburetor Corvair. And the 60 carburetors, everything on a 60, very unique. And some of the features are there's no parts really on the outside, no linkages, no levers, uh, anything like that. It's just all smooth casting all the way around, pretty much on both sides, no threaded holes or anything in these carburetors. The other thing is uh, there's no choke mechanism in these at all. You know, it's just open. There's no, no need for a choke. And the reason is the choke is in the air cleaner. And of course, on a 60, to make that choke work, that means your air cleaner has to be there. The lid for the air cleaner, the hoses that connect the air cleaner to the top of the carburetor, if you don't have any of those parts, the choke flap might be working, but the choke is not gonna be working because there's no way to restrict the air if the carburetor is open. The other part that they did on the 1960, which is unique to a 60, like most everything else, is vented right into the atmosphere in the engine compartment. This little hole here under this cover that goes right inside the, uh, the bowl of the carburetor. And that's how they vented the fumes out. That was common at the time on all uh, you know, carburetors being made. There was uh, no concern about venting uh, gas fumes to the atmosphere. So that's the way everybody did it. And that's the way they did it on a Corvair. So these carbs are, are very simple, not much to them. Uh, there's no choke mechanism whatsoever, as I'd mentioned, and uh, no real attachment points for any kind of linkage or anything on the side, because there is no linkage on the side other than the throttle plate uh, lever itself. So uh, like everything else, the 60 is unique, and the top of the carburetor is round. It's not, uh, doesn't have the little provisions for the air cleaner hold down, of course, because tubes went on these. So like everything else on a 60, uh, those are unique. Uh, and as much trouble as they went through to make that whole system work with this choke and the heater tube that had to go down to the exhaust manifold and all, uh, they had to change it all for 1961 for two reasons. One is that the uh, station wagon and the van was coming out and they couldn't have this high mechanism. They had to get the the, the engine lid down as low as possible. So with the height of the air cleaners on here, they probably could only go about that much higher. All this stuff that was on top, the whole air cleaner and all, simply would not fit onto uh, or underneath the engine compartment of the uh, vans and the station wagons. So that had to change, they had to get rid of that. And in doing so, their choke mechanism went away because they were doing it in the air cleaners. So they decided in 61, well, you know what? Let's uh, let's just do it the old fashioned way. We'll put an, a hand choke on it. So the new 61s came out and uh, they did in fact have a, uh, uh, a choke inside the carburetor now. So when we uh, move our, our lever here that's connected to the choke cable that runs all the way to the front, we can open and close the choke manually. And as the choke opens and closes, it also opens the throttle up to create a fast idle by the series of levers and riding on this eccentric cam here uh, to speed up the idle speed. So it's, uh, you know, manual chokes are generally used on pretty inexpensive cars. Uh, and uh, it wasn't a great solution. I don't think, uh, you know, Chevrolet had had automatic chokes on their cars for a long time. And uh, 
there were no other Chevrolet passenger cars built at that time with a manual choke. They all had automatic choke, even the, the uh, cheapest models. But nonetheless, that's what they used on the uh, 61s was a manual choke. Now, in order to make everything work, they had other changes too. In order to have a air cleaner hold down, they had to change the casting on top for these little holes here with this, that little uh, clip that went over and snapped to hold your air cleaners on. The air cleaners are very low profile. Uh, as you know, you're familiar with those teardrop style air cleaners. And then importantly, they could no longer vent the gasoline to the atmosphere in the engine compartment because one other thing that the Corvair had to change was that the gas heater that was in the 60 models <coughs> worked great. I mean, instant heat and all that, but it did take some gas to use that. And the competition had a field day with, you know, beating up the Corvair and its gas heater. Here's an economy car that costs you money, miles to the gallon when you turn the heater on. But instead, the Falcon has its free water heated, you know, heater and on like that. So it was really quite a problem for sales department to overcome that because it was true that gas heater did use some gas. I've seen ridiculous uh, percentages put out there. Some say, oh, it cut your gas mileage in half. Well, no, it didn't. It, you know, at maximum output, it might've been like two miles to the gallon. But, you know, in a car that's supposed to be an economy car, that's, that's an issue. So they came up with the new direct air heater, which presented its own set of problems. And one of them is all the air that's used to heat the inside of the car first goes basically around the motor and in the engine compartment. So if we were venting the carburetor into the engine compartment, if you turn the heater on under certain conditions, you'd get gasoline smell from those vapors that were coming from the carburetor. So Chevrolet had to do something else. And what they did is they internally vented the carburetor. So no more was that little piece over here open to the atmosphere. Now they vented the carburetor, they added here we go. They added this piece, which we generally call the duct bill for an obvious reason. And at the very bottom of it is a hole inside the uh, duct bill. Let's see if we can get a shot of it down there. Uh, the light's a little poor. Uh, let's see if we can illuminate that a little bit better. Let's try this. Can we see that? Can we see that hole down that? Trying to aim this for the camera is uh, a little bit difficult. Well, folks, take my word for it. There's a hole at the bottom. And uh, that's how they vented it with this uh, hole in the bottom so that the, the gas fumes would end up in the air cleaner, basically. Uh, so it wouldn't be exposed you know, to the edge compartment and the heater. Well, the other thing that the new recirculating air system uh, caused in the Corvair was that the engine compartment temperatures were higher than they were in 1960. And that means hot soak became more of a problem. What's hot soak? That's when your engine's good and warm, you shut the engine off and you go in to the store or whatever for say, I don't know, more than five minutes, but less than a half hour. And you come out and you go to start the car up and uh, it doesn't want to start. You're cranking and cranking and cranking and cranking. The car doesn't want to start and you finally get it started. That's hot soak where the gasoline has gotten hot enough that it's given off a lot of fuel vapors. And now those fuel vapors are collecting in the air cleaner because we've vented it into the air cleaner, not to the outside where they just kind of dissipate. And so basically your engine is acting like it's flooded because of all that extra gas in there. So bulletins started to appear. Here we have one from uh, June of 1961. And one of their solutions about 
erratic idle was for the Chevrolet service techs to drill a hole in the throttle plate. Yeah, they wanted to wanted you to drill a uh, small hole inside the throttle plate somewhere around here. And it was to be a 16th hole in an 80 horsepower engine and a 332nd hole in the 98 horse. So that was uh, one little bulletin. And then on August 30th, they had another bulletin out and basically told people if they were restarting their Corvair and if the engine didn't start within 10 seconds is to slowly push the gas pedal to the floor and hold it there just like the engine was flooded. And uh, they said that the engine, uh, it said, do not operate the starter more than 30 seconds continuously without a brief pause to allow the starter motor to cool off. So this was getting to be a problem, cranking your car for half a minute, if it's not starting. You know, like I say, it, it, it was starting to cause problems. So then, yet another bulletin in August of 61, they changed the gasket on the air horn. The old ones uh, were open above the floats. The new ones had the two little holes that you're probably familiar with from your rebuilding kit. And uh, what they were finding is that uh, Corvair models with three or four speed transmissions may occur a cutout on hard right-hand corners due to uh, fuel spilling out of the bowl and going up in the vent. <clears throat> so apparently Corvair drivers were starting to have fun with their Corvairs and go uh, zooming around some corners, causing some flooding problems. So uh, new gasket style in the carburetors coming out. Uh, other than that, the 61s are again, pretty simple. Uh, Manual choke is your big tip-off. For 1962, they rethought this manual choke deal. You know, with the Corvair being one of the very few American cars on the market with a manual choke, I mean, really automatic chokes had been around, you know, since early in the 50s, so it wasn't the new thing. And it says some cars in the 40s and all, uh, only the very cheapest bare bones models, even back then had a manual choke. So. Chevrolet decided we got to put an automatic choke on these things. You know, this, this hand choke just isn't making it. So that they did. Uh, the duck bill was still in the carburetor. I don't know what happened to my little red pointer. We'll just use this. The duck bill was still here for a vent with the hole at the bottom where my, my uh, wire is going through at the very bottom of that. Uh, so that didn't change. The uh, choke valve now was still inside the uh, carburetor just like it had been, but there's some new equipment on here. The, uh, a rod comes up from a thermostatic coil down by the exhaust manifold. You're all familiar with that. The rod comes up through the upper shroud and uh, operates this lever. That in turn, when we make this mechanism move, it moves a fast idle cam in place so that the idle speed is faster with the choke on. And there's also a mechanism here that's the choke unloader. So that say the engine is actually flooded. When you floor the gas pedal, right here, you can see that arm touching right here is causing the choke to open up. Not a lot, but it's open some. It's not fully closed. If I release that, I can close the choke all the way. But when I floor the gas, the choke will open uh, by the unloader tang here, which is touching the throttle linkage, okay? There's also, this device is called the choke pull-off or vacuum pull or vacuum brake, a couple names for it. The purpose of it is if the choke was fully closed when the engine first started, well, that's too much fuel, it's too much choke. You need to open it up some for the engine to breathe. So this port was added to the carburetor and it goes right to manifold vacuum here and to the hose and up to the vacuum brake diaphragm. When the engine starts up, creates vacuum in the manifold, it pulls this diaphragm open and you can see 
makes the choke open up a little bit. And that, that's how the choke works. And then of course, as the engine warms up, the coil expands, pulls the choke rod down and open. So that's the big change in 62, the addition of the uh, automatic choke mechanism. Uh, otherwise the carburetors are pretty much the same. And of course they had to add that extra pipe. But they were still having some problems with Corvairs. The engine compartment temperatures were still an issue. Now the Corvairs were developing more horsepower and uh, the hot start problem was getting to be kind of a big deal. So for 1963, the carburetors came out with yet another uh, revision, and that was to open up two holes in the throat of the carburetor here that go down to the to the uh, the float chamber there. And that's now how we're venting the Corvair with these two holes in the carburetor. Uh, otherwise, it's pretty much the same as the 62, except they made a new linkage here for opening up the uh, with a flooded engine. Shell, if you can get in on these two. This is the 62 style with this long lever. This is the 63 style. And it does the same function when you floor the gas pedal. This lever hits the back of here and opens the choke. So it does the same thing as the 62 did, but this was a little better. It had less friction. Let's see if we can make this all happen here. It had less friction at this point where the linkage touches it, so it made it easier for it to open. So that's the 63 style. And of course the 63 also has our two vents up on top. Now, what about all those Corvairs out in the field? Well, <laughs> things weren't going so good with the difficult restarting on the Corvairs. So here's yet another technical service bulletin from July 10th of 1962. Now this was before the 63 carbs came out. They were telling the dealers to go ahead, take the carburetor tops off and drill those exact holes that are now in all the 63 carburetors. They're showing us to take the carburetor top off and basically drill these two holes from the bottom out to open up that venting to try and get the cars uh, better ventilation in the carburetors uh, to help dissipate some of that, uh, to help dissipate some of the fuel vapors that are causing all these hearts. Now, remember I showed you that the service bulletin came out a little, that was in, uh, July. And we had yet another service bulletin. They're going to love this one. <laughs> the situation was so desperate to help get rid of those vapors that they were recommending hot starting on 63 Corvairs was so bad, they recommended drilling a hole in the side of the carburetor body, actually through the side of the carburetor body to help get those vapors out of the, uh, out of the air cleaner and the carburetor for restarting. I've got a couple examples here of carburetors that had that done. And later on, somebody decided, well, maybe that wasn't such a good idea. So here's one with a screw into the hole that was drilled previously for the hot start. And here's another that they, uh, I'm not sure if it was a screw and they cut the head off or it was just a, a piece of lead or something. But again, that hole was uh, the temporary fix. Uh, so can you imagine telling the customer that? Well, yeah, we made it better, we put a hole in your carburetor that fixed it. 
Yeah, right. So Chevrolet was aware of these problems, obviously, of the hot start uh, problem in particular. So they finally addressed it in 1964. And along with the fixes that they did, of course, we had the new larger displacement engine now in 64. So uh, we did a few other changes to help the Corvair carburetor out. The first thing that was the big solution for 64 was the addition of a vapor vent. The vapor vent is this little round rubber piece. It's on a kind of a spring steel here, stainless steel, uh, screwed onto the base of the carburetor and the shaft of the carburetor linkage touches this when it's at idle. So if I open the throttle up, it's not touching, the rubber is sealed against the base of the carburetor. If I bring this down to idle, you can see that it bends the arm, the stainless steel arm, and it opens up a little gap here between the rubber gasket and the body of the carburetor. Now, where does it go to? Well, there's a hole drilled through the carburetor and there's now a passageway inside the carburetor that I'll show you where it ends up. This passageway comes up into the top of where the carburetor bowl is at. That's where all our fumes are gonna be, our, our gasoline, when it starts to get hot, it's making a lot of vapor. It's going to, the fumes are gonna be up on top. With that vapor valve open, this one's got the vapor valve off, but you can see the hole where it goes into, okay? And the fumes are gonna come from that top area across into here and they'll exit into the engine compartment during that period of time when the fumes are being generated if the throttle is at idle only. Once you open the throttle, that passageway is closed off. It does say if you look in your owner's manual on the 64 and later cars that you could have a momentary smell of fuel upon restarting the engine. So it was a compromise that they knew that those gasoline vapors would be causing uh, some gas fumes in the car. But after you started it up and the engine fan uh, you know, moved everything around, the vapors would be gone in pretty short order. But uh, it wasn't ideal, but at least it got the cars so they could start when they were hot without having to crank them until the starter motor was glowing red hot. Now, they also made some other changes in 64, which I'm gonna set these aside. Some other changes in 64, which were very uh, beneficial to the uh, uh, carburetors. One is they decreased the size of the float and added a spring on it. This is your 60 to 63 style float, okay? Just a float with nothing special. In 64, the float is actually skinnier. It's a, a smaller float. And more importantly, it's got a tension spring on here to help increase the, the uh, holding power of the float against the needle and seat. So if I put these two next to each other, you can see, let's try and do them this way. I bet I got one down here, maybe I could could give us an idea with. Sure, this is the big float and the little float. So you can see the difference in it. It's not a great deal, but the little float has no provision to mount the spring on it. The little float has a little hole in its arm. I think we can find one here, somewhere. Yep, the little float has a little hole here in the arm where the spring goes right there. And the other part of the spring just sits next to the needle right down there. So that spring 
is very important. If you've got the small style float, you need to have that spring. If that spring isn't on there, you're gonna have flooding problems because this helps the float close against the needle in the seat. Spring has to be used with this style float, okay? The other thing they did was they changed the Venturi cluster. Now, there's several different Venturi clusters in every year because the diameter of the idle tube is done according to the engine and transmission combination. There's very subtle differences, like a thousandth or two thousandths of an inch, very small differences. So there's a number of them each year. But the basic design of the 60 to 63 is just this uh, evenly placed spoke design here of the main Venturi discharge. In 64, it was changed. It's kind of a, a weirdly shaped one. Uh, by offsetting it like this, it had better distribution of the fuel at lower throttle openings. So they're trying to make the car uh, have better transition from idle to the, the power circuits, especially at low throttle openings. So the 64 and later style is the uh, oddly shaped one. 63 and earlier is the evenly spaced Venturi cluster. Okay. And the other thing that happened for 64 is of course, you know that that was the year that we introduced the single air cleaner in the middle of the engine. And it's got two J bolts, one at each end of the crossover tube that hold that crossover tube to the carburetor top. So what they did is two things, this casting on top, the air horn, this area was hollow previously on the 63 and later cars. They made it solid so they could drill a hole through it. And that is where our J bolt slides into. So if we had our little piece of wire here that I constantly keep losing, <laughs> here it is. So if we were pretended this was our J bolt, our J bolt would go right in there. If you tried to do this and just drill that area out on a 63 carburetor, well, you're gonna find out that all of a sudden you're in no man's land because it's hollow inside. You can drill through to the other side, but you're gonna have a space in there where it's open. And now you've got an external vent. You could get gas leaking out of here on hard corners or certainly a gasoline smell. So, uh, you know, trying to drill out the early carburetor, probably not the best idea for that air cleaner hold down. Another tech bulletin, we got lots of bulletins. This one came out in February of 1964. Complaints of poor engine performance at high speeds, 60 miles an hour and over on 64 Corvairs with dealer installed air conditioning uh, could be due to the lack of added fuel flow, which is needed on air conditioned equipped Corvairs. The added fuel flow is necessary due to the change from the single air cleaner that the car normally came with to the dual air cleaners that are necessary with air conditioning. And the, uh, uh, the carburetor should be modified as such. And the bottom line is they said they should replace the standard metering jet that came in the carb, which was typically like a 51 with a size 53 jet to enrich in the mixture some. So, and that was in 64. Uh, for high speed driving. So that was our 64. It was a great improvement over our previous years, especially the vapor vent on the bottom of the carburetor. Cause that was super important to get those things to be able to start well when the engine was uh, warm. So in 65, oh, by the way, this is the hook I was referring to. This hooks on the, your small little air cleaners. That's why they continued to have this style of uh, attachment still on the carburetors, even though that type of air cleaner was used from 61 to 63, it was continued to be used on the 64 with air conditioning and early 64 with oil bath air cleaner, and then also on all 65s with air conditioning. So uh, they continue to use our uh, special little hook here. And in addition, of course, being a 65 carb, it's still drilled for the regular style 
air cleaner that was in service at that time. So the 65 carburetor has pretty much all of the things that the 64 had. It had our vapor vent, importantly, on the bottom, just like 64 had, and it had our automatic choke mechanism. All was pretty much the same, except, remember, in that service bulletin where it talked about the need to put a bigger jet on the cars that uh, are suffering poor performance over 60 miles an hour. So Chevrolet thought about that. Well, you know, if we just put a bigger jet in the car like we did for that service fix, that really fixes the problem of poor performance, but it also makes the car use more gas because when you change the main metering jet, you're going to be using more gas all the time, not just on the time when over 60 miles an hour when you might be throttling it pretty hard. You're gonna use gas anytime you're off of idle. You're using more fuel because of the larger jet. So Chevrolet decided they would install a power enrichment circuit. So shells, come on over here. And then power enrichment circuit, I'm gonna pull out the Venturi cluster. And previously, our Venturi clusters just had a uh, large opening where our main insert uh, was installed in the carburetor. And then we had our gasket go over it and our main well, this is for our main jet, went in there. But for 65, they added an additional circuit and it is, this hole, the second hole in here, and at the bottom of this, I'm just going to flip this over. We're going to have a little brass valve here. This little brass valve is our power enrichment valve. And it's got a seat. It's just uh, drilled into the, the uh, body of the carburetor. I'm going to drop it in here. This goes down to the bottom. And what it does, is when there's a large volume of air flowing past the Venturi cluster, it's causing a low pressure area in this hole because it's connected by slotting over the Venturi cluster so that that low pressure area is causing the needle inside to rise off of its seat. And now, it's pulling fuel directly from the carburetor bowl. How does it do that? A car with power enrichment circuit in the carburetor has this plug on the side of the carburetor. Okay, the earlier carburetor, that one's our 65, that has the feature. Here's our 64 carburetor on the side by the fuel inlet. It's just plain, there's nothing there. On our 65, it's got this aluminum plug on the side, and that goes in turn inside the carburetor to a hole in the side of the carburetor, which intersects with the bottom of where our needle valve is at, okay? So uh, when our needle valve lifts off, it draws fuel, directly from the carburetor bowl up into here and enriches the mixture only when you've got high velocity of uh, airflow going through the carburetor. So that allowed them to keep the jet size fairly small in the 50 thousandths, somewhere between 49 and 51 thousandths was the normal jet size for a 65 car. But when you really got on the gas and got the engine going, the power enrichment circuit uh, engage so it actually enriches your 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 mixture to more like a 53 jet rather than the 51 that's actually installed in the carburetor. So it's the best of both worlds. It got the performance and smooth running that they were looking for without affecting the fuel economy during lower speed operation. So it was a great fix. The power enrichment circuit. Now there is a correlation between the size of the jet that's factory installed and the uh, 
there's a restrictor inside the carburetor. After they drilled the hole from the outside and into here, they pushed a small brass restrictor into the body of the carburetor. So it was metered. And the size of that restrictor is correlated to the size of the jet. Now, that is detailed in Bob Helt's book, because it's not detailed in the shop manual. It's a great book, by the way, the classic Corvair. It's got lots of information. So we can see that the restrictors were either 51 thousandths, 50 thousandths, or 49 thousandths on the jets, and the restrictors were 34, 40, or 046. So if you had the biggest main jet in the carburetor, it used the smallest restrictor. If you had the smallest jet in the carburetor, it used the largest restrictor. So the fuel mixture would end up being uh, as if you had a 53 jet in any one of them uh, during the, the hard acceleration. So it was compensated. So if you had, uh, you say you were gonna rejet your carburetor, you took it apart and you found that it had a 49,000 jet and I said, whoa, that's way too small. I'm just gonna put in a 53 in it. Well, it's actually gonna end up more like a, a 56 because the power enrichment circuit is going to make that, uh, it's going to increase the amount of fuel going into the venturi cluster when you're giving high volume. So be careful about that on the power enrichment carburetors. Don't go crazy and remember that the uh, smallest jets have the, uh, the biggest, largest diameter restrictor for the less amount, least amount of restriction. So that's the power enrichment circuit. In 1966, Chevrolet continued to make some improvements in the carburetor. The biggest one, let's see if we can get a good shot of this. Let's look inside here. We're looking inside the bowl. There we are. See this hole I'm pointing to right here? Inside the main casting, okay? It's in the side of the carburetor and it is pretty much exactly in line with your idle mixture screw. If you were to look on the inside of the carburetor, our hole would be in line with that. And that's called an upper idle air bleed. And what this does is at low throttle positions, here's where our throttle shaft's gonna be. Here's where our idle mixture screw comes out. And this slot right here, okay, that's our off idle transition slot. When your throttle plate starts to open, uh, fuel will come out of not only the mixture screw, but out of this slot. And that helps make the transition because we're not moving a whole lot of, of fuel yet in the main cluster. So we're using this slot to help make that transition to the main power. In 66, they added one further up. It's about another half inch further up in the body there. And it does the same thing. It helps add more fuel to the mixture for a very smooth transition from the basic idle circuit to the slight opening to more opening of throttle till finally at wide open throttle when these really don't flow much at all. So that's an improvement for 66 is this upper idle air bleed. And that is connected in line, as you can see, with the idle circuit of the carburetor, okay? Another way you can tell uh, a 66 carburetor casting is the other thing they did. You know, emission standards were starting to come into effect. And in fact, Corvair's made uh, for the 1966 model year, uh, that were delivered in California, except air conditioned cars and except turbos, had to have an air injection pump or smog pump. It's 
a lot of people call it. So they had to change the carburetor casting here. This extra bulge on the casting, you're only gonna see on 66 and later carburetors. Okay, so this part here is the smog uh, part of it. And what they did is added a spot. It's directly in line. Now this is a 66 style. It's got a brass screw in here. It's kind of like a needle valve. I'm gonna take it out. Okay, see it's like a, a needle valve. It goes into that hole. It's got a seat where it goes in. And basically air goes around the actual screw in these slots here. And it kind of dilutes the idle mixture so you cannot adjust it as fully as you could a previous model, which doesn't have the circuit. In other words, we're adding extra fuel to the idle circuits in all of them, all of them that use this idle circuit, which is both the upper hole that they just added that year and the transition hole plus the idle circuit, they're getting more air in there to help lean out the mixture, okay? It is adjustable on the 66 and 67. We could screw that down uh, until it actually was fully seated in there, at which time it wouldn't really do anything and you revert it to back being like, a, like an earlier carburetor. But this was handy for uh, meeting the emission standards. This was a factory set part. It really doesn't talk about it in the shop manual because you're not supposed to fiddle with it. But of course we do. And uh, if you can't, if you've got one of these style carburetors, the 66 or seven uh, air injection carburetor, then uh, if you can't get a satisfactory idle adjustment, you know, if you think if I could just get a little more out of it, you might try and turn this in or out some, depending upon whether you feel you need more air or more fuel. And that may be able to get you where you wanna be, okay? Now, at this time, let me find it. Because we were also had the power enrichment circuit in place. And then they brought out the extra bleed here. There are some early 66 carburetors that have both the idle air bleed and the power enrichment hole in there, just as the other 60, uh, 65 and 66 cars do. So here's our little power enrichment valve going in its normal spot. In February of 1966, they decided that, you know what, we need these cars to run a little bit cleaner. We don't want people messing with them. So they eliminated the power enrichment valve out of the air injection carburetors. The regular 66s and 67s continue to have it, as you can identify it by the plug on the side, but the air injection cars didn't have it any longer. Uh, they eliminated that feature. And in, now this is a 66 style carburetor early when we know that because it's got both the, the power enrichment and the extra idle air bleed they made the air bleed non-adjustable. Our other one had a nice screw where we could fiddle with it, but this one has a fixed idle air bleed. There's no screw there for us to turn. It's kind of pressed together and it has a little plastic piece on top to keep you from getting your screwdriver in there to try and turn anything. And that's kind of what the industry was doing. They were putting caps on the idle mixture screws and limiters so you could only turn them so much. And uh, that's what they did on the Corvairs. So you could have an air injection carb with either one of these styles. The earliest cars uh, had an adjuster. The later cars had a non-adjustable one. This one's a little bit of anomaly. It's got an adjustable one, but no power enrichment like the earlier ones. So 
what exactly were they doing? Kind of hard to say because this particular feature is really not covered in any of the shop manuals. It just says that extra air vent was added. That's all it says. Doesn't give us much of a clue. So those are uh, the basics of the regular primary carburetors. The 68 and 69 models, none of them had power enrichment circuits at all. The last year for power enrichment was 67. 68 and 69 carbs are pretty much the same. They've all got the added casting for the uh, extra uh, air bleed here on the idle circuit. I have noticed on carburetors that there's two different bases having been used over the years. This is the one you're probably all familiar with, the standard looking Corvair base, but starting in 65, I've run across a base that looks like this. It's not straight like the other one is. It's kind of curved around the uh, throttle plate here. And uh, otherwise the carburetors are identical. What's the difference? I don't know, in 1961 in one of their bulletins, they mentioned that there were two manufacturers making these for Rochester. One was Rochester itself, and another one was uh, another company. And perhaps that other company was doing uh, these carbs uh, in this style. And I have found later style carbs all the way uh, up and through 69 of this style in both primaries and secondaries. So we apparently use kind of randomly this style base. It really doesn't matter. The carburetors are otherwise identical. But if you run across that, uh, it's probably one made by a separate manufacturer rather than Rochester, or it could be made at a different plant. We all know that the Los Angeles Corvairs were slightly different than the Will Run Corvairs, and it could be that the one Rochester plant used a different casting. Uh, so we don't know that for a fact, but it is a different style that was being used. I've got one here to show you that here's a, uh, a secondary carb, and we know this is a 65 style secondary from its throttle lever, and it too has the odd style base that's not straight along like the rest of them. There's a couple differences in secondaries. The big difference is between 1965 early and 1965 late. 65 early is just a basic carburetor. There is no idle circuit whatsoever. There's no uh, nothing, no throttle position screw no uh, vapor vent on the bottom, uh, no power enrichment circuit. It's just a basic carburetor because really the only time it works is pretty much wide open throttle. That's the only time you're using it, okay? So in early 65, they used a throttle plate that was basically a throttle lever that was basically the same lever they were using on the primary carburetor. Why not? Why make a special one? Don't need it, otherwise it's the same. Problem they ran into was that these secondaries would work whenever you floored the gas. So if your engine wasn't fully warmed up and you floored the gas, chances are it would fog really bad or backfire and pop uh, when you, you stomped on it with a pretty cold engine. So Chevrolet decided, oh, well, we can fix that. So they came up with this lockout mechanism for the secondaries. And believe it or not, of all the carburetors I had here tonight, I could not find a complete carburetor with all its guts on a 66. So I'm gonna show you in the shop manual here. The throttle lever was completely different. It had a little hook on the end. There was a spring-loaded lockout lever. And then another connector rod went to a rod that went through the top of the carburetor like a a choke rod, and it worked by having that little tang of that touch the choke mechanism on the primary carburetor right next to it. Uh, it is probably the poorest carburetor linkage I think I've ever seen, and any of you with a late 65 or 66 probably know how poorly it works, uh, mainly because it, on the secondary rods, when the choke is locked out, what happens if the engine is flooded and you got to floor the gas pedal? 
well, if the secondary linkage won't move because it's locked, you can't floor the gas. So instead of having a direct linkage, they put springs on the actuating rod. So the springs would compress when you floored the gas. So you could floor it to open up the chokes to start the engine, but it's a very uh, uh, poor design. We have parts of one here. This is the actual rod itself, the, the linkage. This would be uh, bent, bent straight. Somebody's bent this one. Like I say, it's the only one I could find. Uh, and on this side, uh, it would have the uh, more of the lockout mechanism as in the picture the rod went all the way through. So it's a uh, unusual style. And as I had talked about before, the casting changed that they were using. So this is a secondary carburetor, uh, 66 style housing here with the provision for the, uh, the extra idle air bleed on the outside, even though it doesn't have it. The, it was never drilled out on this, but they changed the casting and it could be used with or without actually drilling it. So here's a secondary with that style casting. So we know it's from a 66. And the last change, that they made on the secondary carburetors was since they had brought the secondaries out, like I told you before, it has only a power circuit. You stop on the gas, it just goes wide open, has no idle circuit, uh, no choke, no anything else. The problem with that is people who never floor it. So grandma's got her 140 automatic Corvair and she never goes over 40 miles an hour and certainly never puts her foot on the floor. Well, those secondary carburetors are just filling up with gas, it's, it's, it's evaporating out, it fills it up with more gas, evaporating out. Pretty soon the inside of that carburetor is nothing but dried up sludge in the bottom of it. And even if you wanted to use the secondaries, you couldn't, it wouldn't work because once the gas got in here, there was no way for it to get out. So in 68, they decided, you know what? We can fix that. So they added a fixed idle circuit into the secondary carburetor here, if I can get this. You can see that the idle position where a mixture, the idle mixture screw would normally go has actually got a hole drilled in it, okay? So that, let's see if we can get that a little better. There you are. So there's that hole drilled in there, right there. And that hole is a fixed idle circuit. In other words, there's no screw on the outside to adjust this. There's nothing to turn. Simply whenever the engine's running, the engine vacuum is applied to the hole and it pulls a small metered amount of fuel through the Venturi cluster and its idle jet. The earlier 140s didn't have an idle jet. Remember I said that this was your idle jet in the Venturi cluster, okay? Well, the 140s without the idle circuit don't have one. It's just for the main jet, that's all the circuit they had. When they reintroduced that carburetor with the new idle circuit in the secondaries, they added a new uh, idle tube. It's got a very small, small hole in there, but it's enough just to keep refreshing the gas a little bit. So whenever the engine runs, there's a small amount of fuel that's being consumed in the uh, secondary so that the work. So that's kind of the rundown of the, the Corvair history on the carburetors. Now, what's the best carburetor? Because I know somebody's going to ask that. Well, I would say that a 66 or 67 model carburetor, which is going to have the features of can you get them all? It's going to have the features of the vapor vent, which is very important on all Corvairs, especially if you've got a 62 or a 63 car without any of the improvements on the on the carburetor. They are they're hard starters when it's when it's uh, a uh, a hot engine. So having the vapor vent is a very good feature. Having the power enrichment circuit as identified by the the, uh, the plug in the side of the bowl here that will help keep the mixture 
uh, rich when it needs to be it, uh, be able to get good fuel mileage when you're not on it, and having as we talked about, the upper idle air bleed inside the housing here that we mentioned is in line, right in that hole there. So maybe you can get in the light here a little better, Shelly, to see that. That's our upper idle air bleed. There we are, right in line with our transition hole, it's down in the body. So a 66 and 67 has all those features. The upper air bleed, power enrichment, and the vapor vent. Next down the line, I would say, I would probably use a 68, an air injection carburetor, a 66, seven, eight, nine. It doesn't really matter which one. Uh, I have always been able to get a reasonably good idle out of those cars, even though it's got an extra air bleed in there. I really haven't had any problems getting a, a proper idle. Those carburetors have all the features uh, that the uh, other ones, uh, the improvements on the 66, uh, they don't have the power enrichment circuit. Uh, so you may need to go a little bit bigger on the jet. But it's it's a good carburetor overall. It'll it'll work fine for you. Has all the improvements. Next down the line, I would use a 64. Uh, it does not have the power enrichment circuit, nor does it have the upper idle air bleed inside like we do. It's certainly a lot better than the 62 and three carburetors. But if you uh, really want the smoothest operating carburetor, uh, I would go with the 60 six and seven, next choice, uh, an air injection carburetor, and, and finally a 64. If you're trying to be really stock on your car, you, you know, the 63 is, is what they came with, uh, but th they've got inherent problems compared to the later evolutions of the carburetor. So that's, uh, that's my choices on the ones, to, uh, the ones to have, okay? I would be careful about carburetors that are so-called rebuilt by people who are not carburetor experts, you know, send your carburetor into us and we will fix it. Oh, they'll fix it all right. I've seen so many carburetors that they just had a pile of carburetor parts and they took yours apart and they just reached in the bin and they found one of these, one of those. And hey, if it had that, that idle, that air passage here, but we don't got none of the parts for the rest of it. Well, we'll just plug that hole up right here disable that feature. Uh, if it's not somebody who's Corvair knowledgeable, and really you had to be pretty knowledgeable to know all these differences to get an exact match pair. And that's the goal here, an exact match pair. So they're the same on both sides. Uh, you know, do it yourself. You can do it yourself. It's not hard. It's a very simple carburetor. And if uh, you can't do it yourself, there's specialty people who will do it. You know, Wolf Enterprises, Clark's Corvair Parts, there's other, other Corvair vendors out there that'll do it. Give it to somebody who knows what they're doing. Uh, don't go to the local parts store. They're, they're not gonna do you any favor. And avoid, if you find a, 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 a quote, rebuilt carburetor on a swap meet table, that is not a, uh, a brand new Delco Rochester like this one is. This is actually a brand NOS carburetor. That one would be fine. Uh, but if it's from, you know, some other uh, company that does a uh, uh, rebuilding, uh, just just take a pass. It's a good, clean core. That's what you got when you buy one of those. So, uh, hey, Larry, what, well, yes. While you're there at the bench, do you have any books or literature that you'd recommend? Oh, yes. Class? Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you. Thank you. So one that we already talked about here was Bob Held's book. Uh, the classic Corvair. Uh, Bob has passed away, but Bob is was our technical editor for Corsa for many, many years. Very uh, savvy guy. Uh, for instance, in this book here on our carburetor section, we've got all our part numbers for the uh, Venturi clusters. Here's the carburetor specs, all the details on the sizes of all the passageways, uh, you know, all the uh, 
for both the primaries and secondaries. And uh, I mean, it's got everything you want to know. And then there's a you know, whole talking about, you know, where we get into the uh, differences, you know, and some modifications for turn cutout for you autocrossers and such. So this is a wonderful book to have. It should be in your Corvair library. This one is actually a Chevrolet publication, Corvair training program. And this one covers everything that we've kind of talked about here. It tells you how to read the tag so you know what the carburetor is. And it talks about all the variations of the Corvair. It shows you where all the little power valves go if you have that, the main well insert, uh, all the differences. And then goes pretty much uh, circuit by circuit, off idle, idle system, float operation. It gives all the theory of how this thing works. And uh, don't worry that uh, your local uh, Chevrolet dealer doesn't have this. These are available as a reprint from Clark's. It's like four bucks. So I would certainly have that carburetor training manual. And then of course, your appropriate year shop manual, uh, you know, go to the store, Chevrolet, and it's going to have your rebuilding procedures, how to calibrate everything. And uh, here's our secondary lockout mechanism, like we talked about, how to make those adjustments on that uh, miserable 66 throttle linkage. Uh, so those are, uh, those are the books that I would have uh, for the basic rebuilding. If you want to do some modifications to the carburetor, so there's a number of modifications that are covered in the course of tech guides. There's volume one, two, three, and four right now. And there's a special going on of those. They even have them all on one flash drive. So uh, there's several ways that you can get that. But those are the uh, uh, those are the basics. Certainly the shop manual. I mean, if you don't have, if you're trying to work on your Corvair without a shop manual, go home, go home, get a book and after it comes and you can start to work on your car. Go home. I like that. All right. Yeah. Hey, this was great. I want everybody to notice <clears throat> how much work Larry put into um, setting this all up and going through all the carburetors and, uh, you know, make sure he's had them all in line here to be organized. So thank you, Larry. And thank you, Shelly, for all the detailed camera work, because there's a lot of little things to see. Um, we do have a few questions. I know okay, we we'll are try. a little bit past the hour, but if folks have to leave, they'll hang up and we'll just go through here. Um, Carl Kelson, our friend over on the other side of the pond, or way on the other side of the world, is asking, do factory air-conditioned Corvairs have different carbs? Yeah, and, and really the only difference is the mixture. Uh, they have a, a different jet in there. Just like I described in the one TSB, the technical service bulletin, where they talked about uh, they needed to put a bigger jet in there to uh, make it perform well. If you look in the shop manual, you will see in the specifications here in engine fuel, a lot of times, especially in the 65 and later, there's a separate part number for the carburetor on air conditioned cars because they typically run a different size jet in them. Uh, as far as other features, float level, the, the hard parts of the carburetor, uh, they're all the same, but a different jet size, maybe a different Venturi cluster. Uh, that's very well covered in Bob Helt's book because he breaks down all those parts on there. Uh, would a regular Corvair uh, carburetor work in place of an air conditioned one? Yeah, it'd be fine. Uh, you know, to really dial these in because we've, we're complicated today. A carburetor is a best guess on what the car needs. I mean, that's why fuel injection is so wonderful because it compensates for temperature, altitude, fuel quality, you know, it does it all electrically. Well, a carburetor doesn't know that. It just, it just does what it can and it's a best guess. So, uh, if you, if you really want to dial one in, you would put in an air fuel mixture gauge, you know, weld in a oxygen sensor into the exhaust and check the fuel mixture of the carburetor. And you would see at different times, it would be running too rich or too lean. And by playing with the jet size or the idle jet size, you could uh, make it closer to ideal. But uh, that's a lot of work and that's a lot of fuss. Uh, to do that, you know, the carburetors work okay. I mean, this was a simple carburetor. It was a cheap carburetor, and it's uh, it's never going to be real precise, but you can make them better 
Uh, and of course, like I say, fuel quality varies tremendously. And the more ethanol in the gas, the, the more of it you got to use. So you may have to uh, increase the jet size just because your area has, uh, you know, you, you got to use ethanol in it. The, the typical problem we feel with uh, fuel starvation or small jet size is when you're going along at a steady speed, say 35, 40 miles an hour or so, just trying to hold it, and you want to give it a little more gas. You won't want to go 40, you want to go 43, and you give it a little more gas, and it just kind of, it's floundering. It's just not accelerating. I mean, if you really push your foot down, oh, it'll go fine, but just to try and ease into the throttle, that typically means you need to go up in the jet size, and typically going up 1,000 not going to make much difference, but two thousands don't go in, don't go in three thousands or four thousand step, but two thousands bigger than what's in there. That'll probably cure that. And again, that a lot of that is caused by, you know, the type of fuel that we have to use today. You know, it's, it's not 1966. We can't go down into the Sunoco station and fill her up with 260. So. All right, let's catch another one here. <clears throat> Does the power enrichment passage get plugged during normal operation of the engine? I have taken carburetors apart where the needle valve has gotten stuck in the bore. I don't think I've ever seen it get plugged, but I've seen the power enrichment valve stuck. So usually you can get a screwdriver down in there, wiggle it around a little bit and it'll come loose, flip it over, take it out and just kind of polish it up a little bit, not with sandpaper. You don't want to make it lighter, uh, but just kind of polish it up a little bit so it's nice and smooth and it'll be fine. Uh, so I, I've not seen that. I've seen carburetors that somebody forgot to put it in or they put in the wrong part. They put in a discharge needle instead, which was worthless. And when you leave it out, boy, you get bad gas mileage. So uh, yeah, but uh, I don't, I've never seen the passageway plugged up. Okay. How I'm about sure it's happened somewhere? <laughs> how about um, once the two bowl vents were added to the sixty-three plus carbs, was the duckbill and vent added on earlier carbs still necessary? Well, in, in the technical service bulletin they had for uh, the sixty-two models, when they told you to go ahead go inside, take the top of this off and drill out the passageways. So you got the two vents in here. They didn't tell you to plug the duckbill. In fact, it would have three of them. And it's interesting that this new old stock carburetor here is that way itself. It's got the two vents and the duckbill is also got the hole inside of it. I don't know if we can see that in the, in the bottom of the duckbill, it's too, it's too, uh, too dark. But this one has all three, and it's an NOS carburetor. Okay, now the, now these NOS carburetors, they're kind of a mishmash. I told you about you know the parts store carburetors, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Well, that's kind of what GM did, except they knew what they were doing. So this has the top with the three holes in it, and uh, but it's still a 63 carburetor without the uh, vapor vent. But the, the the castings are there for it. They simply didn't drill them out. So it's uh, uh, there's no reason that you need to plug the duck bill vent. If it's there, no reason to plug it. Okay, let's get to the next one. Um, <clears throat> what size jet do you recommend on a 66 carburetor with the power enrichment valve? Well, again, like I talked about, every situation is different. The altitude you live at, how you drive, uh, the kind of fuel you're using, it all makes a difference. So there, I can't say if there's one jet that's going to be right for everybody. That's, that's impossible. Uh oh, did we lose Larry again? Oh, no. Okay. Well, okay. We might have lost Larry again. I'm so sorry, guys. Um, Uh, Larry, you back? Hello. Okay, yeah. we're back oh, here. All right. 
due to technical difficulties. <laughs> we need one of those little things with the TV. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, right. so I, I guess I'd first have to ask, are you encountering a problem, a drivability problem? Because if you're not, don't mess with it. You know, the factory knows what they were doing. Uh, we just got to compensate for what's changed now since then. And that's going to be the fuel quality, mainly the fuel quality. And then your particular environment uh, where you're driving the car. So, uh, you know, a, a stock 66 would have had probably 50s or 51s in it. Uh, if it's running fine like that, I'll leave it. If you need to... Uh, increase if it's got a, a hesitation like i said trying under light acceleration to go a little faster light acceleration and it feels like it's just kind of hanging back and not wanting to go but if you really step on it harder it goes okay that's an indicator you could go up about two thousands on the jet size and that would fix it two thousands from wherever you're at so if you've got a 49 in there you know, go to a 51 if you got a 51 go to a 53 you know, don't just arbitrarily, it cannot arbitrarily say, oh, yeah, put a 53 in everything. That's that's not going to work for you. Not well, anyway. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab maybe just a couple more here because we're getting kind of late for the East Coasters. How yep. exactly does flooding occur in hard turns with 66 carbs? What about flooding it? Why does it do it? How exactly does flooding occur in hard Oh, turns? that's really... <laughs> Well, you see these two vents on the top of the carburetor that we drilled in our earlier ones and came came with uh, uh, the later carburetors. Well, when you get into a really hard corner, and you got to be cooking pretty good, the fuel that's in the bowl of the carburetor, if you go into a corner that makes the fuel slosh to the side, that fuel is going to slosh up inside the top cover and where is it going to go? It's going to come out of these vents. It's going to come out of these vents. And of course, that's your air inlet. So the raw gas is, is coming from the vents and going down into the carburetor. And we call that turn cutoff uh, under severe cornering. So you autocrossers know about that. And uh, it's kind of self-correcting. You keep your foot on the floor and eventually you'll use up that gas. Of course, your, your runtime will be poor. Uh, there's ways to fix it. There's turn cutout tubes that can be added. That's covered in Bob Helt's book. It's an old uh, autocrosser's trick to add turn cutout tubes inside the, uh, the top of the carburetor so that the fuel has to go through a much longer path before it can come out the top and down the throat. Okay, well, I have uh, been nagged here that I missed a question, but the, it was written as a statement rather than a question. So I'm going to word uh -huh. it as a question, but I don't know if they meant it as a statement or a question. It was I don't written know, let's as, it out. can interchange the carbs on 60 to 63 with later carbs. Can interchange the carbs on 60 to 63 with later carbs. Can you put a later carb on a 60 or 63 car? I think that's the question. I would, uh, I would assume. There you sorta, go. Sorta. Sorta. Now, I did that on my 60 because uh, I wanted to have the smoothest running car that I could. So what I did is I started with a, 60, uh, five, a 66 or 67 carburetor base. So I used the, the whole base of the carb. And then I put the top from the 60 so I could use my air cleaner so it's got the uh, the round part on top where my hoses are going to go uh, but it doesn't have anything else up here it doesn't have a choke or any of the other stuff that the later carbs have so I just didn't use any of that I didn't use the the fast idle mechanism or anything else because it's already in the choke mechanism so my bottom end had the vapor vent on the bottom it had the uh, power enrichment circuit. It had the uh, uh, upper idle air vent. Uh, so it had all the really good stuff on the carburetor, uh, but it still had the 60 top, so it looked pretty right. So you'd have to look pretty close to, to see that it had the extra screw hole here for the uh, pivot on the, uh, the fast idle cam. You know, that was still on there. I guess I could have cut it off, but it just didn't matter to me that much. So you could 
uh, put the earlier top on a later bottom. And same with 61, uh, you could transfer this, all this mechanism will fit a later carburetor and you gotta use the, the early carburetor top uh, to uh, make that later bottom work. And on a 62 and three car, it's a bolt on, you don't have to transfer anything. You can just put on a, a later carburetor on an earlier car and it'll be just fine. And it'll really help with the, the, the hot engine restart. So, so yes, I think, I think that was a valid question and, a, and, and the answer is yes. You gotta be a little sneaky on 60 and 61 because of the special requirements of that motor, but you can use the, the main important part, the base from the later carb. Okay. And don't, and don't forget, by the way, very important with this, uh, with the hot soak, is these carburetors came with a Bakelite insulator between the carburetor and the cylinder head, okay? Very important that you put those between the base of the carburetor and the cylinder head. All 61 and later cars came with that. It's very important you put it on. Carburetor kits often come with these thin little gaskets. If you wanna use the gaskets in addition to the the Bakelite insulator, uh, that's, that's fine, but never use just the gaskets in place of the insulator. The insulator is very important to help prevent the heat of the cylinder head from uh, warming up the carburetor to that temperature. Good. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Shelly. Thank you, everybody. Um, as I said, these will be, these are all the videos are posted on our uh, YouTube channel. Sure. But again, thank you so much, Larry and Shelly, for volunteering to do this. And um, and Jeanette, the, thanks for being our coordinator. Yes. Oh, well, thank you. I enjoy doing it. And I'm glad everybody's getting a lot out of them. So thank you guys and have a wonderful evening, everybody.